Good afternoon, brethren. And thank you for that special music, very fitting for this time of year. I'm going to begin asking you a question today. What do the Pope of Rome, the Patriarch of Constantinople, and several ma major church denominations have in common with the Church of God in the spring? They all wash feet. Each year on Monday, Thursday, Thursday before Easter, the Pope washes the feet of 12 men, sometimes church officials, as part of the celebration of Easter, though they do not wash his. The English kings until James II did the same thing. So did kings in Madrid, Munich, Vienna. I have an article here from the New World Encyclopedia. And today we're going to learn a vocabulary word. Do you know there's a proper term for the religious foot washing observance? It's made up of two Latin roots. See if you can hear them. The word is pedilavium. Can you hear the Latin roots in that? Ped, elavium, foot and wash. They say it's a religious rite observed by several faiths, including Christianity, Islam, and Sikhism. Within Christianity, Jesus gave the command in the New Testament, and we'll look at that later as a sign of humility and brotherhood. But the religious act of foot washing is also practiced in Islam and Sikhism as part of ritual cleanliness. Within these religions, purity and worship is very important. Furthermore, the predominantly Hindu culture of India, in that culture, touching the feet of others is seen as a sign of respect. Within Christianity, the foot washing observance was practiced in the earliest centuries of the post-apostolic era, and often at the time of baptism in Africa, Gaul, Germany, Milan, Italy, Ireland, the Albigenses, Practice it during communion, the wall dances uh, when uh, ministers visited, the early Hussites sometimes observed it, and foot washing was often rediscovered or restored in revivals of Christianity in which participants tried to recreate the faith and practice of the apostolic era, especially prominent during part of the Reformation called the Radical Reformation. It's still observed today in some Catholic parishes by local priests and deacons. And other groups through the centuries, well-known groups, have had a form of foot washing. Some Anglic Anglicans, Lutherans, Methodists, United Methodists, sometimes at ordination services, Seventh-day Adventists, Church of God of Cleveland, and among the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Mormons, they actually have two different forms of pedilavium or foot washing. But I grew up in a northern Baptist church, and we never washed feet, although we did have communion. I never washed feet until I came into the church of God. So what makes foot washing in the church of God different? is that it's performed during the Christian Passover. So why has this practice become part of religious observance? What does foot washing have to do with our worship of the great God? What attitudes are represented by this rep religious act? It has something to do with the other end of our body, our minds. And so today we're going to analyze four prime scriptural examples of foot washing to ascertain what lessons we can gain from this annual observance. Very soon, again, we're going to be observing the foot washing during the Passover. So let us learn what it has to teach us from the Bible. The title of today's sermon is Foot Washing Attitudes. Foot Washing Attitudes. Cleanliness and attention to a person's body were regarded by the Israelites as matters of primary importance since they lived in a hot climate and the law required 
it for good health. The practice of foot washing as an ancient habit of welcoming a guest into your home was widespread. So upon entering a host's home, a guest had his feet washed by a servant, usually the lowest ranking servant. Why? Because this act was considered the most humiliating and the most demeaning chore. But this service demonstrated affection and personal attention from the host for his guest. Washing the master's feet was one duty of foreign slaves, though not expected of Israelite servants. And it was the service a wife often owed her husband in ancient times or children to their father. And with Passover in the spring, the roads were often muddy and unsanitary due to the seasonal rains. And people did not wear shoes and socks as we do today. They wore sandals exposing the wearer to dust, mud, and animal waste, which was often in the roads. Now, in Jesus' time, meals were often eaten, eating, eaten while reclining on what was called a triclinium. That was the Roman style of a U-shaped table, very low lying to the floor, and the guests would eat lying on cushions away from on the outside of the table with their feet away from the food. And they would lay on their left side and eat with their washed right hands. No one wanted to smell dirty feet. And so the feet were angled away from the food. But they were always, at least in most cases by custom, washed before the meal. And so the servant would pour water upon a guest's feet from a pitcher over a copper basin. Rub the feet with the hands and wipe them with a towel. And that practice is still common in some Eastern countries to this day. So let's begin our four examples. Example number one from the New Testament, church widows. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and starting in verse 3. 1 Timothy 5, starting in verse 3. I'll be reading from the, New, the King James today. 1 Timothy 5, verse 3. The Apostle Paul writes, Honor widows that are widows indeed. 1 Timothy 5, verse 3. So this section has to do with how widows are to be treated. Verse 3, honor widows that are widows indeed. And verse 5 now she that's a widow indeed and desolate trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. And now drop down to verse 9. Let not a widow be taken into the number, that is, enrolled, under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. Now at that time, women were dependent on the males of their family. Their husbands, or if their husbands were deceased, a son or a brother, someone to take care of them. But as people came into God's church, sometimes they were ostracized. They might be removed from the synagogue or from the Greek temple, the pagan temples, and they were destitute. And so the early church of God took these widows in to support them financially. Now it says, let them not be taken in or enrolled under three score years old. The reason is, age 60 and upwards was considered old age. Now, when I read that, I was greatly disheartened because I passed another milestone in the 60s just this past week. But it was a special honor if a widow or the hostess would wash feet. Notice. Under three score years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she's brought up children, if she's lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, and if she has diligently followed every good work. So here we see an example of hospitality, a special honor that would be done by the hostess, in this case a widow. 
This practice of showing such hospitality is first mentioned in the book of Genesis. When Abraham says, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And then as the two continued on their journey and meet Lot, Lot says again, tarry all night, wash your feet and rise up early and then carry on. When Abraham sends Eliezer to find a wife for his son Isaac, Rebekah's brother Laban says, as Eliezer and party arrive at their home, let some water be raised up, provided for you again to wash your feet. And then when Joseph invites his brothers over to his home for a meal, before he reveals himself to them, they provide them water to wash their feet. There was a common custom of hospitality. So that's attitude number one in our list today. Hospitality. That these New Testament widows continued this custom, which this long-established custom of providing such hospitality. But you know, hospitality is not just inviting someone to your home. There's a whole frame of mind that is hospitality, making people comfor comfortable in our presence so that they feel at ease and therefore part of our family, so to speak, at home with us. They enjoy being with us and consider us part of the family. So that's attitude number one, hospitality. So let's go to example number two now, and this is the woman called Abigail. Abigail, wonderful story back in 1 Samuel 25. Let's go back to 1 Samuel 25. Now this is a time when David is on the run from King Saul. Saul is trying to kill him, and certain mighty men have aligned themselves with David. They're on the run from Saul's army. So they're a sizable force, and they're moving through the territory where shepherds would be raising their sheep. 1 Samuel 25, verse 1, this is the story of Abigail. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him, and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David rose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. This is the end of the Judges period. We're now well into the Israelite monarchy. Verse 2, and there was a man in Maon, which was in southern Judah, whose possessions or property were in Carmel. Now, this is not Mount Carmel, but a city in the south of Judah. And the man was very great. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, this was a major income source for a shepherd to shear the sheep and to sell that and after that activity, which took some time, they had a huge festivity with food and drink, as we will see. Verse 3, now the name of the man was Nabal, the name of his wife, Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding and a beautiful countenance, but the man was churlish. I like that old King James word. It means rude, coarse, and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. These two were unequally yoked. How did this happen? Well, we're not told. But it may have been an arranged marriage by her parents, maybe in desperate circumstances, we don't know. But she is a woman with a rare combination of beauty, brains, and character. Nabal is here described as a descendant of faithful Caleb, though he certainly does not have Caleb's faith, as we will see. There's even some evidence that he may have been a relative of David, which will perhaps explain David's request of him, as we'll see. Nabal, in this story, has a name that means folly or foolish. And you wonder, why would parents name their boy fool? Hey, fool, come on in, time to eat. Well, you see... Names had different nuances, and I don't think his parents intended that when they named him. But the author of this story uses that sense of fool or foolish to illustrate the kind of character that he was. So Abigail means source of joy, and she certainly is, as we will see. So now we go on in verse 
4. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. So he sent out ten young men. And David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, to Nabal, and greet him in my name. Ask after his welfare on my behalf. And thus you shall say to him that lives in prosperity, Peace be both to you, and peace be to your house. Peace be to all that you have. Shalom, in a sense. And now I have heard that you have shearers. Now your shepherds, which were with us, we hurt them not. Neither was there aught missing unto them, all the while they were in Carmel. And ask your young men, and they will show you. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in your eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray you, whatever comes to your hand, to your servants and to your son David. In that time, when an army was on the move, it may surround these shepherds, and if they protected them, acted like a wall to them, then they were by custom to be provided for by the shepherd. And so David sends his men to go and ask Nabal to give them some provisions. I mean, they're on the move, they're on the run from Saul, <clears throat> so they should have expected something. And if David's related to Nabal, it's even more so they should have expected something in return. So verse 9, they came and they spoke to Nabal according to the words of David. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who's David? Who's the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. See, he's in effect insulting David by saying, You ran away from Saul, didn't you? Maybe he didn't know the whole story. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed from my shears and give it to your men, whom I don't know where they come from? So David's young men turned away, empty-handed, and they went back, came and told them all those sayings. And David said to those men, Gird you on every man his sword. Now David may be displaying some rashness here, as we see down in verse 21, he says, Surely in vain have I kept all his house in this wilderness, so that nothing is missed of all that pertain to him. He has requited me evil for good, verse 21. And then verse 22, So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave of all that pertain to him by the morning light, any male. Now the King James is more graphic, which I will not go into here. But he refers to a male. David says, gird on your swords back in verse 13. So his men did. David did. And off they went, 400 men. And 200 stayed back to guard the equipment. Verse 14. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out to the wilderness to salute our master. And he railed on them. That is, Nabal railed, insulted, denounced. He insulted them. He acted abusively. This is what they tell Abigail about her husband. But the men were very good to us, David's men. And we were not hurt. We didn't miss anything as long as we were in their company and we were in the fields. They were a wall to us. They were protecting them from marauders and thieves. By night and day, all the while we were with them keeping the sheep. So now, therefore, know and consider what you will do. For evil is determined against our master and against all his household. For he is such a son of Belial. <laughs> Describing Nabal. A man cannot speak to him. You can't talk to him. He is such a fool. And so Abigail made haste, took 200 loaves, two bottles of wine, wineskins, five sheep ready dressed, five measures of parched corn, Hundred clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, laid them on asses, on the donkeys. Old word there. And she said to her servants, go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband, Nabal. And so it was. And she rode on the donkey that she came down by the covert of the hill. And behold, David and his men came down to her, and she met them. And that's when David tells her that, her husband had requited him evil for good, and that he was about to kill all the males of this group, of these shepherds and of Nabal's family, 
Now, let's notice how Abigail responds. Verse 23. When Abigail saw David, she hasted. She got down from the donkey. She fell down before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground, fell at his feet, and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. Greek word, havan, fault, moral evil. She recognized that what her husband had done was morally wrong. And she is willing to take the blame for her husband. Let this come upon me. Let your handmaid, she, notice how she calls herself a handmaid. I pray you speak in your hearing or in your audience and hear the words of your handmaid. Let not, my Lord, I pray you, referring to David now, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal was his name, and folly is with him. Or as we might say, Nabal is his name, and folly is his game. But I, your handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom you did send. She calls David, my Lord, 14 times and herself handmaid or maidservant six times. Now therefore, my Lord, verse 26, as the Lord lives, and as your soul lives, seeing the Lord is withholding you from coming to shed blood and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now let your enemies and they that seek evil to your Lord be as Nabal. She recognizes God is using her to prevent David from making one of the biggest mistakes of his career, avenging himself. And now this blessing, this gift, which your handmaid has brought to my Lord, verse 27, let it even be given to the young men that follow my Lord. And therefore I pray you, forgive the trespass, again, taking Nabal's blame of your handmaid. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, an enduring dynasty, because my Lord fights the battles of eternal, and the evil has not been found in you all your days. She knows what an outstanding character David is, and she's trying to prevent him from ruining his reputation by killing all these men. Yet a man is risen to pursue you. Talking about King Saul, 29. To seek your soul, but your soul, the soul of my Lord, shall be bound in the bundle of life with the eternal your God. And was that is how God would preserve David, like a bundle. And the souls of your enemies, them shall be slung out as with a slingshot, or like this, as a sling might be at that time. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he's spoken concerning him, and shall have appointed you ruler over Israel, that this shall be no grief to you, nor offense of heart to my Lord either that you have shed blood causeless or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the eternal shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember your handmaid. Remember me when that time comes. Now notice how impressed David is with this response. David said to Abigail, 32, Blessed, be the Lord God of Israel, which has sent you this day to meet me. David recognizes this was an act of God that moved her to come to him and head him off from this disaster. Blessed be your advice, 33, and blessed be you which have kept me this day from coming to shed blood and avenging myself at my own hand. David's kind of come back to his senses now after this mild guidance from this woman. And in very deed, verse 34, as the Lord God of Israel lives, which has kept me back from hurting you, except you had come and hasted and come, surely there had not been left by morning light any mail. So David received of her hand that which she brought, and he said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I've hearkened to your voice and accepted your person appeal. Now we're coming to the foot washing yet, but this is the essential background to understand what happens. And Abigail came to Nabal. Behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing less or more till the morning light. 
And it came to pass in the morning, when the wine was gone out of him, his wife told him all these things. His heart died within him, became a stone. It came to pass about ten days after, the eternal smoke Nabal, and he died. You see, God avenged David. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Eternal that has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and kept his servant from evil. For the Eternal has returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. Why? Why does he marry her? Well, down in verse 44, you remember Saul had given his daughter to David as wife. Her name was Michael, M-I-C-H-A-L. Well, in verse 44, Saul takes her back and gives her to another man when David's on the run. And so David wants this outstanding woman, Abigail, as his wife. Her husband is now dead, and so he wants to take her as his wife. 40, and when the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they spoke to her, saying, David sent us to you and to take you to wife. She arose, bowed herself on her face to the earth, and said, Behold, let your handmaid be a servant, here it is, to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. She was willing to take on that responsibility the rest of her life of just being a handmaid, maid servant, washing the feet of David's men. So Abigail hasted, arose, rode on the donkey, and five damsels with her went after her, and she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. <clears throat> it's a beautiful story. In a way, it's a love story, but they relate to foot washing in this way, these ways. Number two, Attitude number two, back in verse 23, she deferred to David. She showed homage and respect, deference. In other words, she was esteeming others better than herself. Verse 23, and when Abigail saw David, she hasted, she got down from the donkey, fell before him on her face, and bowed herself to the ground. Paul tells us this in Philippians. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. She was living that principle in this story. So attitude number two of foot washing is deference. The foot washing represents these attitudes, outstanding characteristics of Abigail. Number three is in verses 24 and 28, and that is intercession. <clears throat> She fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. And let your handmaid, I pray you, speak in your audience. And then verse 28, I pray you, forgive the trespass of your handmaid. She is accepting her husband's blame and sin. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. This is intercession. Attitude number three, she intercedes. She is willing to suffer vicariously for her husband, just as our Savior suffered for us vicariously, taking upon himself our blame. You know, sometimes we suffer for the mistakes, the sins, the wrongdoing of others, even in God's church. And foot washing here represents this willingness to suffer even unjustly or unfairly, but still willing to suffer in order to be of that mindset, that frame of mind of Jesus Christ himself. That's number three. Number four is her supplication. Again, in verses 24 and 28, she supplicates as a humble servant asking for forgiveness. She fell at his feet. Upon me, my Lord, let this iniquity be. In verse 28, please forgive. She's supplicating David on behalf of her husband. Supplication. When we perform foot washing, again, we're reminded of where we stand with Christ. 
that daily we come to him and supplicate him for forgiveness. Because the Christian life is an ongoing experience of overcoming sin. Of removing this leaven daily. And we're reminded of it during the spring for those seven days. But it's an ongoing experience. And so please, have mercy. That's attitude four. Supplication. Attitude five. Peacemaking. She made peace by her actions and by the attitude which she took. That's why David says to her in verse 35, go up in peace to your house. She resolved a dilemma that could have brought blood unjustly, unfairly upon David's hands. When David was about to act rashly, and she stopped him by her humble approach of being willing to even wash the feet of his servants the rest of her life. And David accepts her sacrifice. Certainly, the Passover season reminds us of our need to be at peace with each other. Now is the time to settle matters with those with whom we may be at odds. We see this example here in the story of Abigail and David. Jesus tells us in the book of Mark, have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. So that's five, peacemaking. Let's move on to example number three. And that's the sinful woman of the Gospels. So let's go to Luke chapter seven for example number three. Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. Luke 7, starting at verse 36. Luke 7, 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to food. Now, in that time, inviting over a famous teacher to a banquet was considered a virtuous act in the Jewish world. And so they gather at the Pharisee's house. In verse 36 and 7 now, Behold a woman in the city which was a sinner. That's a mild way of saying she was a woman of ill repute. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat, or reclined at this U-shaped table, perhaps, or some kind of reclining, where they would eat, lying on their side, eating with one hand. She brought in an alabaster box of ointment. How did she get in there to begin with? Well, you see, in that day, sometimes... It was customary in some communities for neighbors to come in and stand along the walls as spectators and watch what was going on. They did not comment. They only watched the proceedings, watched the guests eating on their cushions around this triclinium, and sometimes they would even get some leftovers. But that apparently is how she got in here. In verse 38, she stood at his feet. Again, he's laying down on one side, his feet are away from the table, so she goes down to his feet, and she's weeping. She began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment, foot washing. Slaves sometimes used their hair to wipe their master's feet. But it was considered a disgrace for a woman to let down her hair in public. But it shows you how desperate she is for something special that she's asking from him. She kisses his feet, a demonstration of high regard, an emblem of love and reverence, subjection, and even supplication. And so she rubs into his feet ointment. New King James says fragrant oil. And in the account in Mark, we're told it's a spikenard, very precious spikenard. Spikenard was an olive oil mixed with spice and aromatic ingredients, perhaps from the Himalayas, 
by way of the trade routes. And so these people would spend a good deal of money to acquire these precious um, aromatic ingredients. And they would mix up this concoction, sometimes to preserve it for their own funeral. But that's what she uses on Jesus' feet. 39, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spoke within himself saying, this man, if he, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she's a sinner. Look at this accusative tone. And Jesus answering said to him, knowing what's going on in that cranium, Simon, I have somewhat to say to you. He said, Master, say on. Rabbi, go ahead, teach me. And he tells a parable. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence, or denarii, and the other 50. 500 denarii was more than a year's wage for a laboring man. And when they had nothing to pay, he openly, freely forgave them both. So tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. He said to him, you have rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered into your house and you gave me no water for my feet. I remember as a host, this is an insult to Jesus. He gave me no water, but she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. 45. You gave me no kiss, which was customary, even men to men in the Near East. But since this woman, or this woman since the time I came in has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil you did not anoint. It was customary to give oil to put on the hair because of dry, dusty conditions. But this woman has anointed my feet with ointment. So wherefore, I say to you, her sins which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Those for whom little is forgiven are those who think they have little to ask forgiveness for. Only a few small sins. But she recognized the kind of woman she was, and she's trying to change her life. And she comes to this man, who she accepts as her teacher, to beg his forgiveness and performs these acts in a worshipful manner. And he said to her in 48, your sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him, food with him, began to say within themselves, who is this that forgives sins only because only God can forgive sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Another wonderful story. And here we have attitude number six. This sinful woman displayed repentance. This feeling of regret, remorse for sins or wrongdoing that led to her sense of guilt, being overcome by it. And she comes to Jesus to seek forgiveness. She knew he had the power to do it. We're told in the book of Isaiah, to this person will I look, even to him or her that is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. This woman trembled at the word of God that Jesus had been teaching. She was poor, she was contrite, and Jesus forgave her because of her repentant attitude. Foot washing reminds us of the daily need of repentance. And then verses 48 to 50 gives us attitude number seven. That because Jesus forgave her and she walked away free, she no doubt had gratitude, relief. Can you imagine the joy she must have felt to have a clear conscience, knowing that all that guilt in the past is gone, washed away. 
That's what we feel every Passover, isn't it? That we've had our sins forgiven. We again have that clear conscience and can go on to serve Christ. So that's attitude number seven, gratitude. Let's move on to example number four, our last one today. <clears throat> and this is the example par excellence. The first three, I want you to notice, all involved women. Widows, Abigail, and the sinful woman. This one, of course, involves Jesus the Savior. Let's go to John 13, starting in verse 1. John 13, verse 1. I mentioned the women of the first three examples. Men considered washing someone's feet too humiliating and demeaning. And that was a threat to their honor and to their status in the family. So if there was to be foot washing, it would be done by a servant, the lowest servant, or if it had to be by the women of the family. And so that heightens the importance of what Jesus does in this chapter. John 13, starting in verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own which were in the world. He loved them to the end, to the uttermost. And what we have about to be performed is, in a sense, an acted parable. And it's remarkable, only John gives us this part of the Passover observance. It's not in the Synoptic Gospels. And so during supper, or supper being ended, the as some Greek texts have it, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things to his hands, and that he was come from God, and he was going back to God, rises from supper and does something they could not have imagined. He laid aside his garments, took off the outer garment, perhaps another layer of the inner garments, stripped himself. He was not naked, but he got down like a servant to perform an act of love. And he took a towel and he girded himself. And after he pours water into a basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. This was the lowliest of all services and extremely humiliating. In fact, in the Roman world, humility was despised because it was a sign of weakness. Disciples were not expected to wash the feet of the rabbi. Still, not one of them offered to wash Jesus' feet. But to the recipient, this service was especially refreshing, cleansing, he washed the disciples' feet. Verse 5. And when you read the, the end of this chapter, you find Judas was present at this time. Jesus washed the feet of Judas. If anyone could have been bitter and resentful in washing the feet of Judas, it would have been Jesus. How about us? Do we hold any bitterness or resentment against anyone? If anyone could have held it grudgingly, it would have been Jesus. But he did not do that. Can we do less? Verse 6. He comes to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus said to him, What I do... You don't know, you don't understand now, but you will understand later. And Peter said to him, you'll never wash my feet. Probably a mixture of humility and pride. He doesn't want his rabbi washing his feet. And he's trying to dictate to him. He says, no, but also, no, I can't let you wash my feet. But Jesus said, if I wash you not, you have no part 
with me. I want you to notice this word part. What is this? No part with me. Now, Peter objects. Verse 9, but he says, Simon Peter said to him, well, Lord, in that case, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. It's somewhat humorous, but there may be more behind this. So he objects, but then he perhaps recognized what was happening because of the word part. Jesus said, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. And what Peter may have recognized was the Old Testament teaching, going back to the book of Exodus, that when religious authorities came to performing sacred service, what did they do first? They washed their hands and their feet. Aaron and his sons would go out to the labor, out in the front of the tabernacle, dip in a pitcher, pour it on their hands and their feet before going into the tabernacle to perform sacred service. Washing, cleanliness. Peter may have begun to put two and two together. It's got something to do with service. Moses and the priests. Moses washed their hands and feet before performing, Moses and the priests rather, all washed their hands and feet before performing civil or religious service back in Exodus. And then on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, in preparation for his duties, would take a whole bath from head to toe. And Peter may have caught the similarity at this point between the priest's practice and Jesus washing him in preparation for having part of Jesus' ministry. Unless I wash your feet, verse 8, you will have no part with me. Now that word part is meros. In the Greek, meros. And it means a participation in the same thing. Having fellowship with someone, a share, a place with someone. In other words, you're taking part in some activity along with your host, having a part with them. But to have a part with Jesus means total and complete obedience with no conditions or reservations. That Greek word meros is the same word used in Revelation where we read, blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. We will have part. We will participate with. We will be along with others in the first resurrection. So what Jesus is offering Peter in verse 8 was a part in the ministry of the church. And in fact, Peter will become that early leader of that young church in the book of Acts. And he's offering Peter a part of the kingdom of God. And unless you learn the lesson of foot washing, you cannot have part in the work of God or in the kingdom of God. It's that essential. And so that's why Peter responds the way he does, I think. He says, in that case, give me a whole bath, if that's what it takes, verse 9. Verse 10, <clears throat> Jesus said to him, he that is washed, New King James, bathed, needs not except to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. Now, in this word, uh, verse, we have two different words for washing. The word for washed in the King James, bathed in the New King James, is the word luo, luo, which means to, as a rule, to wash the whole body, to bathe. And as the Art and Gingrich lexicon says, it's an allusion to the, allusion to the cleansing of the whole body in baptism. It has some connection symbolically. And sure enough, we find in the New Testament examples where baptism, in baptism, we are laid out in that tank of water. In a sense, it's a whole body cleansing. Remember when Ananias was sent to Saul, who became Paul? He said, rise, Saul, be baptized, and wash away your sins. 
we have a similar verse written by Paul years later. Let's draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with evil from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And then in Titus, he talks about the washing of regeneration. In Ephesians, Paul writes later, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. In the ancient world, a wife would take a purifying bath before marriage, as they do today. Before his church, Christ provides the water to prepare her for the marriage. And so that first word, verse 10, washed or bathed, refers to that whole body washing, which I think is typical of baptism. But then what goes on is also important. That if you're fully washed, you need not except to wash your feet. And that is a different Greek word, nipto, <clears throat> washing only part of the body. It's the same word used back in verse 5 when Jesus washed, nipto, the disciples' feet, just part of the body. See, after bathing, care was taken that the feet, which would become soil between bathing and, and traveling again, would again be washed separately, as would happen because it was customary at Passover for people to take a bath, or maybe two baths, ceremonially before the Passover service. But when you got to the facility, you would wash your feet because you had been walking along the roads again, where you would pick up dust, mud, and other things you wouldn't want to have upon you. <clears throat> so the washing of the feet, you see, is a reminder to us of a reconsecration. That at Passover, we reconsecrate ourselves unto him to serve yet another year. Baptism happened once and once for all when we were converted. But every year, we're reminded of that daily cleansing that we need to wash those feet. And feet in the Bible has great significance. In fact, walking with God requires feet, clean feet. In the Psalms, in Proverbs, we read things like this. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I thought on my ways and I turned my feet to your testimonies. And then when we come to a New Testament, John, who writes the last books of our New Testament canon, writes verses like this. This is love that we walk after his commandments. That as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that's in you, and you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And then he says, but if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So it's no coincidence, it's the same man who wrote those words, who writes John 13, that we're reading now. Paul uses that same analogy when he writes in Ephesians. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. I think we could consider this foot washing the annual reminder of our daily need to ask forgiveness of our sins. Perhaps even at night as we go to bed, to set the record straight. And when we kneel down to wash another's feet, we're reminded of the continual need of washing off the filth of this world that we pick up just by merely, merely being citizens in it. So this smaller washing reminds baptized Christians who are already bathed, so to speak, 
in baptism, to have our daily sins washed away. But yet, at, bath, at Passover, we wash each other's feet. What significance might that have? Remember what Paul writes in Ephesians, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So I think attitude number eight, illustrated by the foot washing here, is reconsecration, that we're reminded again that we are God's servants, but to continue to serve God, to be part of his work, we need to be clean. We must be washed. So let's go on now to verse 11. For he knew who should betray him. Oh, sorry, back to verse 10. We didn't finish. He that's washed needs only to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are not clean. And here's the beauty of using the King James. Because ye, ye are, and ye are clean, but not all. It's plural. See, in modern English, you can be singular or plural. But in the older English, ye was plural. So Jesus is speaking to all of them as a group. You are clean, but not all, for he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So after he'd washed their feet, taken his garments, was set down again, he said to them, do you understand what I do, have done to you? He says, you call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Master and Lord, he was teacher, master, to be believed, and he was Lord, sovereign, to be obeyed. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought, by obligation, to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say to you, the servant's not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent, greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. And that's why to this day, the church of God practices literal foot washing. Some churches consider it just a symbolic of humility, but it's much more meaningful than that. Jesus' performance of this act of humility culminated in argument that the disciples had been having about that time. You know what the argument was about? Let's go to Luke 22. Luke 22 and verse 24. <clears throat> Luke 22, starting in verse 24. There was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest, either just before or even during this last Passover. His disciples are debating... Who will be the greatest in the kingdom? And he said to them, 25, The kings of the Gentiles exercised lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. You know there are inscriptions that mention benefactors? They have been uncovered. And some of these rulers claim to be divine. But you shall not be so, 26, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that's chief as he that does serve. For whether is greater, he that sits at food or he that serves, he's not he that sits at food, but I'm among you as he that serves. And you are they which have continued with me in my temptations. And I appoint to you a kingdom as my father has appointed to me. They have been arguing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom. 30, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. A number of Jews believed in a coming reunion of the 12 tribes, including the Qumran community. It's in their writings. And so this brings me to number nine, attitude number nine that Jesus ended this argument by his foot washing of these 12 men and taught the lesson of humility. 
Attitude number nine, humility, esteeming others more highly than ourselves. Remember the great proverb, the fear of the eternal is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. But apparently this was not the first time they had argued about who would be the greatest. Go back to Luke chapter 9, verse 46. Luke 9, 46. And there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest? And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him, verse 47, and 48. And he said to them, whoever shall receive this child of my name receives me. And whoever shall receive me receives him that sent me. For he that's least among you all, the same shall be great. Jesus' use of a child to represent humility, powerlessness, obedience, dependence, is our model for the blessing of children every Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus taught humility. And even uses that little child to represent it. Let's go to another example, Matthew 20. Matthew 20, starting at verse 20. Matthew 20, verse 20. This will be our last reference today. And then he came to him, then came to him rather, the mother of Zebedee's children. Zebedee's boys were James and John, and their mother's name was Salome. When you combine the accounts, and she came worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. Verse 20. Master, I would ask one small favor of you. He said, what do you wish? 21. She said to him, grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on your right and the other on your left in your kingdom. Just one small favor for my boys, please. Now you see, women could get away with that forwardness more than men could in the Mediterranean world, where men would often argue who is the greatest. And notice how Jesus answers. You don't know what you're asking. Verse 22. Are you, ye, plural, able to drink of the cup that I drink of? And the prophets used the cup to symbolize suffering. And to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with, talking about baptism of death. And they said, we are able. And you know, James and John of these two sons, James is martyred in Acts 12. And John lives on until his well into the 90s AD, but suffers terribly at the hands of the Roman Empire who banished him to an island for a long time. They said, we're able. He said, you shall indeed drink of my cup, be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. <clears throat> but to sit on the right hand and my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to him for whom it is prepared of my father. But then notice the next verse. When the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the other two. Now why do you suppose they were upset? Did you put two and two together there? Because they wanted those positions for themselves. This is the kind of argumentation that was going on among them. So Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever will be great among you, let him be your diaconus, your minister. And whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your doulos, your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. A deliverance. Attitude number 10. Servant leadership. 
I think foot washing reminds us we are leaders, yes, but we are servant leaders. And that's what servants did. They washed feet. Not pushing themselves forward to take a high place, but lowering themselves to serve one another. So there you have it. Four examples, ten lessons, ten attitudes that I think foot washing represents. Foot washing, or pedilabium, is a prevalent and perpetual, rather, Christian obligation. These ten attitudes help us prepare for the foot washing service again this year. I hope that you'll reflect on them between now and the Passover service, even while performing that service on behalf of a brother or sister, Passover night. Remember what Jesus said in John 13. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. We wish you a meaningful Passover and joyous days of unleavened bread.